All right, good morning, everybody. So today we're going to uh, finish up Chapter 8. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about oxidation of alkenes and the addition to alkynes. And the good thing about the addition to alkynes is it's essentially the same thing as addition, addition to alkenes, just twice, because we have two pi bonds, right? With the exception of the addition of water. And we'll see why that's a little different as we go on today. But other than that, things are pretty much so the same. Now, it turns out that we can add oxygen atoms across a carbon-carbon double bond in addition to the other things that we've been talking about. So for example, if you take an alkene like cyclohexene and you react it with potassium permanganate under basic conditions, you can actually get a dialcohol or a diol. These OHs are on, on adjacent carbon, so these are known as vicinal diols. And these are important molecules, actually. Uh, the antifreeze in your car is a vicinal diol, for example. Uh, there are vicinal diols that are useful in pharmaceuticals. There are vicinal diols that are useful in a variety of other uh, areas, okay? And so these vicinal diols turn out to be quite uh, easy to make from alkenes. It turns out, however, that <coughs> potassium permanganate will work if you keep it cold. But this reaction is not well behaved usually, and these diols actually undergo further oxidation to other products. And so we need another reagent that works maybe a little bit better, and that's osmium tetroxide. Now here it's just one step, one pot. You've got potassium permanganate, water, a little sodium hydroxide to make it basic. You add the alkene and the reaction occurs. Does anybody remember what the color of potassium permanganate is? It's purple, right? So you all remember some of those things. I like that. That's good. So it's purple. As you add the alkene to it, what do you think happens to that color? It fades. It doesn't maintain its persistent purple, and so you can actually uh, titrate, if you will, alkenes with potassium permanganate. Uh, we use this all the time in my laboratory as a stain, actually, for TLC, especially for molecules that have double bonds. We will dip the TLC slide into an, a basic solution of potassium permanganate, and it comes out purple and then we slightly heat it, and everywhere an alkene is, that color fades. So that you got the purple background, and then where the spots are, that color fades, and it works really nice as a TLC stain, okay? Osmium tetroxide, however, this has to be done in two steps. The first step is to take osmium tetroxide, react it with the alkene, but then you have to react it with sodium bisulfite to actually remove the osmium. Okay, you don't have to have that step with the potassium permanganate. So this is a two-step process. Uh, can anybody tell me something about osmium? You all know anything about osmium from Jenkins? Yeah, my son uses it sometimes. Okay, what else do you know about it? Is it something I'm going to let you work with? Probably not. Cause Probably not. It's extraordinarily toxic, uh, and it's also extraordinarily expensive. We're going to see it here in just a minute how expensive this is. Okay? So... This is adding in what kind of fashion? Sin or anti? Sin addition. Why do you think that this adds in a sin addition and not in an anti fashion? Where are the two oxygens coming from, for example, for the alcohols? Are they coming from the water or are they coming from the metal? They're coming from the metal, right? And so you've got a metal atom with these two oxygens sticking out, kind of cyst to one another. There's no way that they can actually add in a trans fashion. And so you can see that here. The mechanism for the addition is the same in both cases. Oxygen attacks the pi bond. The pi bond attacks another oxygen. And you end up with this uh, five-membered ring with a metal, OK? And so you can see you have the oxygens being delivered from the same side. In the potassium permanganate situation, water will simply hydrolyze off the, the manganese and you end up with the alcohol. In the osmium case, osmium, this uh, five-membered ring, is actually quite stable. Water cannot displace the osmium, and so you actually have to reduce it off with sodium bisulfite. That's the second step. Okay? But in both cases, you're going to end up with a syndiol. The two OHs are going to be sin to one another, or cis, if you will, okay? Now, 
It turns out that at the time that I wrote this slide, which has been a few years now, if I went to the catalog and I looked up osmium tetroxide, it cost me $40,054 per mole. I think everybody in here would agree that's a lot of money. If I take a typical carbon-carbon double bond and I convert it into a typical vicinal diol, vicinal diol sell for like a few dollars per gallon. So am I going to use something that costs 40 grand a mole to make that? Probably not, right? Especially when potassium permanganate only costs me $21 per mole. So why do we deal with the osmium? We deal with the osmium for a couple of reasons. One, osmium is well-behaved chemistry. It gives you the syndiol and it stops there. Potassium permanganate will actually go from the syndiol if you let it warm up and it will further oxidize to carboxylic acids through a mechanism you don't need to worry about right now. Okay? But osmium's well behaved. Okay? The problem is osmium's extraordinarily toxic and very expensive. I have a little bit of osmium tetroxide in my laboratory that I inherited. And people always ask me, why don't you get rid of it? I'm like, well, because if I ever lose my job, I must sell it, okay, because <laughs> it's that valuable, all right? Um, and it turns out that osmium has other advantages. You can actually um, make this reaction enantioselective. In other words, it can make one enantiomer over the other with certain ligands that you can put around osmium, but we won't talk about that today either. But what you can do with osmium that you can't do easily with potassium permanganate is you can use this in a catalytic amount. Why would that be of an advantage? <coughs> Kaylin, why would it be of an advantage to me to be able to use osmium as a catalyst as opposed to a, a stoichiometric amount of reactant? That's right. So if I have a mole of starting material, I don't have to have a mole of osmium tetroxide, right? I can get away with maybe 5% of that, maybe 2% of that, maybe 1% of that, right? So I can use a very small amount of an expensive and toxic thing. So I could start to make it more competitive. The problem is, as this reaction goes on, you go from osmium in the plus 8 oxidation state, here we are back to general chemistry, to osmium in the plus 6 oxidation state. So is it getting oxidized or reduced? It is getting reduced, right, because the alkene is getting oxidized. Osmium in the plus 6 oxidation state does not do this dihydroxylation chemistry. But you can easily oxidize it back to osmium 8 with something called NMO. And that's the structure of it here. It stands for N-methylmorpholine and oxide. Okay? You all just need to know it's NMO, right? And what it is, is it's an oxidant that takes osmium plus 6 and oxidizes it back to osmium plus 8. But if you take NMO and you place it in the presence of an alkene, it does nothing. It doesn't oxidize an alkene. It only oxidizes the osmium metal. And if you look at it, NMO costs about $190 per mole. That's a heck of a lot better than 40 grand, right? That math works. And so... You can make this catalytic. Yes, this is the cheapest overall, but it's not catalytic, so I've got a lot of waste to deal with at the end. <laughs> Manganese is environmentally not terribly friendly, and uh, we run the risk of over-oxidation, which we don't run with osmium. So osmium tetroxide works really, really well, but it is a uh, little, uh, little more challenging than just using potassium permanganate. Other things that we can do to carbon-carbon double bonds is we can actually chop them in half as if we had an axe. You can take a carbon-carbon double bond and you can completely chop it in half and add oxygens to each one of those carbon <laughs> atoms and get ketones and aldehydes and carboxylic acids. Okay? It's pretty convenient. You have to use a reagent called O3 or ozone. What do you all know about ozone? It's in the atmosphere. Where at in the atmosphere? Lower atmosphere or upper atmosphere? It's in the upper atmosphere, right? And it protects us, 
right, from UV radiation. Turns out it doesn't live very long down here close to Earth. It does get formed out of the tailpipe of your automobiles and it causes pollution, okay? But uh, it doesn't, doesn't exist down, down here very, very well. So you think you can go to the store and buy a bottle of ozone? No, we have to generate it. We have to generate it as we use it. I'll be honest with you, I've only ever done one ozonolysis reaction in my life because they are a pain in the butt. You have to have what's called an ozone generator. You have to bubble oxygen through it. There's these bright lights and these big sparks. It's always kind of fun, right? Especially when you're around flammable stuff. And it generates ozone that you can use to do this type of chemistry. Okay? But what it does, ozone will oxidize an alkene to ketones and aldehydes. And this is great chemistry for you all because all you have to do is identify where the double bond is. Imagine taking your scissors and cutting it and putting an oxygen on that atom and an oxygen on that atom. It doesn't get any easier than that, right? There's no rearrangements. There's no carbocations. I'm not going to ask you to replicate the mechanism that I'm going to show you here in a minute because it is a little complicated for a sophomore. But I want you to see how this happens because this is kind of weird, right? I'm not only breaking a weak pi bond, but I'm breaking what else? A strong sigma bond. And that is not what we have been teaching you so far, right? Strong sigma bonds usually hold up, but not in ozone. Ozonolysis will actually cleave both the pi and the sigma bond of that carbon-carbon double bond. Okay? Now, these processes are actually two-step processes. So the first thing that you would do is you would take your alkene, you would put it in some kind of solvent like dichloromethane, you would bubble ozone through it that you generate from an ozone generator. Once you have completely oxidized the alkene, you then will have to place that reaction mixture in some kind of reducing agent. The easiest reducing agent to use is zinc and water. And that will actually reduce the ozonide that we'll see in just a moment, and you will get the ketone from this, right? That's that part. And then this part will be an aldehyde. So we get an aldehyde and a ketone by the ozonolysis of that alkene. We can also ozonate this particular alkene, but notice that the reducing agent is different. This is just giving you an example of another reducing agent. There's nothing different about the mechanism. Okay? And again, we get a ketone and we get an aldehyde. In this case, we get formaldehyde, which is a gas, bubbles out of the solution. You can actually see that occurring. Okay, so the reducing agents that I'm going to hold you responsible for are zinc and water and dimethyl, what, what would we call that? Dimethyl what? With a S in the Sulfide, right? This is a thioether, if you will. If you were to come into my laboratory and do this reaction, I would tell you all to use zinc and water, not this one. Can anybody tell me why? It's not expensive. It's really cheap. Maybe cheaper than zinc, actually. Not terribly toxic, but it stinks to high heaven. I mean, it's bad. And we already deal with some bad stuff in my lab in terms of odor. But that would take the cake, okay? I mean, it's really bad. And uh, it would be like four skunks in a, in a sack wrapped around your head. Kind of bad. I mean, bad, bad, okay? But it does have some advantages. It's an organic material. So it's soluble in the solvent that you're doing this reaction in. So you can add it, and it all dissolves, and the reaction's over really, really quick. This reduction is actually fairly slow because zinc is a metal. It is not soluble in organic solvents. It is not soluble in water. right? And so it's a heterogeneous reaction, and everything has to come into contact. So I would have to let it stir a lot longer here than I would here for this second step to occur. But you know what? I can live with an extra hour or two compared to the smell. Okay? I really can, because this stuff is bad, bad, bad. Okay? Now, the way that this works, if you look, if you think back to your general chemistry and you look at the Lewis structure of ozone, you'll recognize that it's bent. Okay? It is a bent structure. And those two oxygen atoms on the end are just right for one behaving as a nucleophile and kind of one behaving as an electrophile. Okay, one has the carbon carbon or the it's carbon carbon, the oxygen oxygen double bond, and one has an oxygen atom with a negative charge, right? So this can function as a nucleophile, attack this carbon atom, 
and then the pi bond that's being broken will actually attack this oxygen atom to get what's called a malozonide. Don't worry about where that name comes from because I don't even know where they come up with that name, okay? But it's an ozonide, okay? A, a malozonide, okay? So notice we've got a five-membered ring and we still have that carbon-carbon single bond. These are extremely reactive intermediates that can only be detected for a short period of time. They rearrange really quickly by breaking the sigma bond and inserting one of these oxygen atoms here. So now we have this five-membered ring. It's more stable, but we've broken that strong sigma bond in doing so. But we've never generated a carbocation, so there's no rearrangements other than just breaking that sigma bond. This is what you have after step one. And what we have to do now, how many oxygen atoms do we have in the ozonide? We have three. How many oxygen atoms do we have in the products? Two. So we've got to get rid of one of those oxygen atoms. If I'm going to remove an oxygen atom from an organic species, is that a reduction or an oxidation? If I'm going to remove an oxygen atom, would that be a reduction of that or an oxidation? I'm going to reduce the organic species and I'm going to oxidize the metal, right? And so what happens is when we uh, treat these with one of our reducing agents, we either get zinc oxide, you know, the white stuff you put on your nose when you're at the beach. We kind of get that kind of stuff. The zinc oxygen bond is actually quite strong. Or we get a sulfoxide, depending on which one we use. Right? So if we use the dimethyl sulfide, if we can stand the stench, after reacting here, we'll end up with the DMSO as a product. If we use the zinc and water, we end up with the zinc oxide. Okay? So we have to remove one of those oxygen atoms. I do not care that you are able to replicate, replicate, replicate this mechanism. Okay? What I want you to know is this very first step, that one oxygen atom of ozone is a nucleophile, one oxygen atom of ozone is an electrophile and that it goes to this ozonide that gets reduced. That's really what I want you to know, okay? One has to be careful in this because actually people have done these types of reactions and had explosions occur, okay? So again, not fun kind of stuff, but it works really well to break a carbon-carbon, or excuse me, yes, a carbon-carbon double bond. So we can take carbon-carbon double bonds now and we can convert them into alkyl halides by the addition of HX across the double bond. We can add water across the double bond and make alcohols. We can add alcohol across the double bond and make ethers. We can add X2 across the double bond and make vicinal dihalides. We can add two OHs across a double bond and make vicinal alcohols. And now we can chop them in half and make aldehydes and ketones. Your roadmap for alkenes should be quite rich at this point, quite detailed, right? And so if we take a molecule like limonene, anybody know anything about limonene? What's the name suggest where it comes from? Limonene, exactly. It comes from citrus fruits. Next time you go home and eat an orange or a lemon, probably most of you eat oranges over lemons, probably, I would imagine, but take a piece of the peel, kind of hold it kind of close to where you can see it and squeeze it, and you'll, you'll smell this fragrant aroma come out, right? And you'll see this little spray of, of liquid, and that liquid is a mixture of water and limonene. Limonene actually exists in the peels of these fruits. Can anybody tell me what why these fruits produce limonene. My biology friends, why would a plant produce an organic molecule like limonene in its, in its peel? It is a defense mechanism, that's right. For what? What kind of pest? Fruit flies. Turns out that limonene is extraordinarily toxic to fruit flies. And it's perfectly harmless to us. I mean, you can eat the peel, right? You've probably made a cake before where you've added zest to the cake, which is nothing more than scraped peel, right? Well, you were eating some pesticide, limonene, right? 
And it, so it turns out that limonene, if you go and buy environmentally friendly ant killers, you know, there's some that are environmentally friendly, they usually contain limonene. So fire ants hate limonene, it kills them, right? It repels them. So you, in theory, could take a bunch of your, your uh, orange peels and put on a, on a mound and probably drive off some of, them, some of the ants, okay? What else can you tell me about this molecule? Just by looking at it, is it chiral or is it achiral? Pardon? You think it's achiral? <coughs> you think it's chiral? Which one? Limonene. Oh. Is it chiral or achiral? <coughs> Why? Which one? This one? That's this one? Yep. That's got four different things? Yeah, but that's two bonds to the same thing, right? Yeah, you're right. I know. <laughs> How about this one? Now that one is a chiral center. I know. You were close. I'll give you that, right? So it's got a hydrogen. It's got a CH2 and then a CH. And this one has a CH2 and a CH2. So this going this way is clearly different than going that way. So there are four different things. And so you can have R and S limonene, OK? And it turns out that Mother Nature makes one of them. I can't remember whether it's R or S. Uh, but uh, one of them gets made. You can actually treat this with ozone. And then here we're just choosing to use the dimethyl sulfide, right? We're just going to chop these alkenes, right? And so this will become what? This carbon will become what? What functional group? A ketone, because notice that carbon is bounded to other carbons. So it's going to be a ketone. This carbon will become a aldehyde because it has a carbon and a hydrogen. So it's going to be an aldehyde. This one will become a, a ketone. And this one will become an aldehyde. And <coughs> notice that chopping this one off separates those two carbons completely, right? Because there's nothing else holding this onto the rest of the structure, OK? So we can convert this simple environmentally friendly molecule into a very rich uh, functionally <coughs> group containing molecule that you see here through this oxidative cleavage of alkenes. Okay. The same thing can happen with car uh, excuse me, uh, carbon carbon triple bonds. We can oxidatively cleave a carbon carbon triple bond. Notice that step two is a little different here. How is it different? What's different between step two in the previous reaction and step two now? Water, Water instead of what? Reducing. Instead of reducing agent. That's exactly right. If you look at the carbon of a carbon-carbon triple bond, they are in a different oxidation state than a carbon-carbon double bond. Okay? And so we don't need the reducing agent here. But we're going to chop this in half, just like we do a carbon-carbon double bond. But instead of getting carboxylic, uh, excuse me, instead of getting um, ketones and aldehydes, we're going to get carboxylic acids. So when we chop this molecule, we're going to end up with this carboxylic acid. Anybody know what that one's called? <coughs> You've used it before. It's acetic acid. It's vinegar. Okay, smells like vinegar. This one you end up with one, two, three, propanoic acid. It stinks even worse. Okay, so you end up with ethanoic acid or acetic acid and propanoic acid just by chopping this carbon carbon triple bond. Now, if we chop a carbon carbon triple bond that's terminal, where one of the carbons contains a hydrogen, you're going to end up with the carboxylic acid and carbon dioxide. Okay? This end carbon becomes carbon dioxide. It gets completely oxidized. So you're not going to end up with uh, a formic acid. It gets completely oxidized off, okay? And you get carbon dioxide. Mechanism is essentially the same. You just need twice as much ozone to do it, okay? Now, the chemistry of addition of anything across a carbon-carbon triple bond pretty much was going to follow the addition chemistry uh, that we've learned about for, for alkenes. The only difference is it's going to happen twice, with the exception of water, and we'll see why here in just a moment. Okay? So here we have two weak pi bonds. 
We've got our fictitious reagent XY. We can imagine adding XY across <coughs> one of the pi bonds. But this pi bond is also reactive and will continue to react until you get four new sigma bonds. The reaction should lie to the left or to the right? To the right. Exactly, because we have stronger sigma bonds in the product than in the starting material where we have the weaker pi bonds. Okay? So, <laughs> if we're going to add HX across the double bond, or the triple bond, excuse me, we're going to end up with two molecules of HX adding. If we add hydrogen across the carbon-carbon triple bond, we're going to end up adding two molecules of hydrogen, right? We're going to do all those things that we've learned about before. So, when looking at this, HX will add, we'll get hydrohalogenation occurring, but now we're going to have two halogens. The halogens will be on the same carbon. This does follow Markovnikov's rule. So in the first step, the hydrogen goes to the least substituted carbon, or the carbon with the most hydrogens. Then in the second step, it happens again that way. So we follow Markovnikov's rule in both additions, and that's why you end up with the two halogens on the same carbon. If we add bromine or chlorine across the carbon-carbon double bond, we're going to end up with a tetrahalide. If we add water across the carbon-carbon triple bond, this is very different for you all. Did we get an alcohol here? We did not. We actually got what kind of functional group there? What is this functional group? We got a ketone. That is as far away from an alcohol as you could possibly think, other than the fact that it's got an oxygen. Not even close to the same functional group, right? And we can also use our hydroboration oxidation sequence, but here we don't end up with an anti-Markovnikov alcohol, in this case we end up with an aldehyde. The oxygen being added to the least substituted carbon. Here the oxygen is being added to the most substituted carbon. So why is this different? Why is water so special? Why is it that everything else you just have to think about and do twice, but water you have to think about something different? <coughs> Anna, help me through this. I got my carbon-carbon triple bond. We're going to add water, right? We're going to use sulfuric acid. Actually, it turns out you need a little mercury sulfate as a catalyst for this to, for it to go quickly, but sulfuric acid will work just fine. So I've got some sulfuric acid. I've got a lot of water. What's going to happen in the first step? The water's going to attack. There is a lot of water, but is it a really good nucleophile to break a pi bond? No. no. So what's going to happen in the first step? Okay, very good. And I end up with I end up with a vinyl carbocation, which is not very stable. Right? Just one of the bonds. Yeah. Right? And I will yeah. eventually. Well, they have to, right? Because the hybridization's changed. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Tell me why it's changed. Can anybody help Anna? Why has the hybridization changed? Why did I need to drop bent here? We lost a pi bond, right? I'll let you go with that. <laughs> now what happens? I've got a carbocation. Now what happens? Okay, so how can we do that? attack, right? And we end up with, and all of these steps are reversible, by the way. Right? And of course, we regenerate our acid catalyst. I did. Well, remember, because we have this, right? And then water comes in, or the HSO4- minus comes in and deprotonates that, right? Well, it looks like we just added water across the carbon-carbon double bond, right? There's more. Is that an alcohol? Yeah. Is it? What is the definition of an alcohol? 
I'm asking you to go back because we talked about this during one of the earlier chapters. An alcohol is an OH group attached to an sp3 hybridized carbon. This is not added to an sp3 hybridized carbon, it's sp2. This is a functional group called an enol. En for alkene, all for alcohol. Remember when we talked about phenols? And we did talk a little bit about enols, a little bit. And I told you that their chemistry was similar to alcohols, but not identical. Okay? It turns out that enols are not stable, and they undergo a process called tautomerization. And from your reading, what is a what is a tautomer? What is a tautomer? What's a tautomer? Anna here is resorting to the good friend Google. That's good. Re All right, say, say it again, please, so everybody can hear it. Constitutional isomers of organic compounds that readily enter the brain. Okay, it is a constitutional isomer. So if I'm going to make a constitutional isomer of an enol, and I look at that, it turns out that a ketone is a constitutional isomer of an enol. How does that happen? How does it interconvert? How can I make that a ketone? It's a constitutional isomer, so all the atoms that are in the enol are going to end up in the ketone, right? So the ketone is going to be... Okay, close. Cut that double bond and hit the hydrogen? Yeah. Is this your technical term? Yes. All right. Let me redraw it just a little bit so maybe you can see it a little bit better. Not yet. It's still attached to the oxygen there. I just changed its direction. So I've got this, right? That's all there is to it. This is an acidic hydrogen, right? This is a base, and that lone pair can be kind of like a nucleophile. <coughs> so that lone pair comes down and forms the carbon-oxygen double bond, breaking the carbon-carbon pi bond, picking up the hydrogen. This tautomerization process is an equilibrium, okay? If I did this, you would actually be able to go and observe in a, like the NMR, for example, which we'll talk about next chapter, and you could see a little bit of this, but you see a whole lot of this. Ketones are in equilibrium with the enol tautomer in water, but it turns out that the carbon-oxygen double bond is thermodynamically more stable than this enol system and the equilibrium lies about 99.9% .9 towards the ketone form, with the exception of phenols, and we'll talk about that in another chapter, okay? So, yes, you add water across the carbon-carbon double bond, but there's not an opportunity to add another molecule of water because it immediately tautomerizes the ketone. That's why the chemistry looks different, okay? And so, in this mechanism that Anna was helping me with, we, we did a Markovnikov addition, so the hydrogen should go to the carbon with the most hydrogens. In this case, they're equi equivalent, so we can't tell, right? You end up with the cation that gets trapped by water. In the hydroboration oxidation sequence, that first step is going to be such that the OH gets added to the least substituted carbon, not the most substituted carbon. And that's why you end up with an aldehyde in this case, in this example, with this second, uh, uh, the hydroboration oxidation sequence with this example because of that uh, process. Take home message today is everything that you learned about with alkenes works for alkynes except the addition of water. That's the take home message, okay? 
So if you look at, for example, the addition of HBr across a carbon-carbon triple bond, right, you end up with the vinyl carbocation. The hydrogen goes to the carbon with the most hydrogens. The bromide will then attack, right? You end up with this so-called vinyl bromide. But this is reactive as well. And Markovnikov's rule again will interfere, right? And you will have the hydrogen going to this carbon. You'll generate this carbocation. This might look weird to you because the carbocation is on a carbon bearing an electronegative atom. That doesn't seem like that should be stabilizing, right? If I've got a carbocation, would it want something withdrawing electrons from it? No. So why is this more stable than this? What am I not showing there that you need to know are there? on the bromine. Lone pairs of electrons. And what can these lone pairs of electrons do for that carbocation? They can stabilize it. Actually, you form a carbon-bromine double bond with the carbocation actually on bromine, or the cation, excuse me, on bromine, not on carbon. Okay? And remember, Markovnikov's rule is really all about carbocation stability, right? We're always going to form those stable carbocations. And so when we look at this structure, <coughs> right, if I form this carbocation, we can draw this resonance structure. So I get this resonance structure, I get this resonance structure. This resonance structure is the major contributor, though. Why is that the major contributor? Why isn't this the major contributor? What do you think, Bailey? Why is the one on the right the major contributor? What do you think, Kara? That's true, but what's making it more stable? Why is this more stable than this? Amen? Okay, we've got a carbocation. Does the carbon have an octet? What about over here? Yes, it's all about the octet rule. Every atom over here has an octet. Not every atom over here has an octet. And so this is actually the major contributor to the overall resonance hybrid. Okay? And so we have Markov, this is why Markovnikov's rule works, remember? It's all about carbocation stability, okay? So we'll skip that, talk about this one. So again, we have the first equivalent addition of HCl across a carbon-carbon triple bond. <coughs> okay, we can look at HCl or HBr, doesn't really matter. You end up with these uh, initial uh, vinyl halides. Carbon-carbon double bond is also known as a vinyl group, right? so we'll call them a vinyl halide. You end up with um, these that are still reactive, and they will undergo an ad additional addition of HCl, and you'll end up with these dihalides. Again, the halogens are always going to be on the same carbon. Right? So when you're taking a test, you're doing your homework, think about that. If you see samples or, or solutions where the halogens are on different carbon atoms. You need to think about that carefully because what we're talking about here, okay? Now, you might think that you can make um, these vinyl halides just by adding one equivalent. You would technically be correct. This is a big industry making vinyl chloride, polyvinyl chloride. You have to have vinyl chloride to do that kind of chemistry for those of you in polymers, okay? And you might think, well, I can just take a carbon-carbon triple bond and just be very careful with how much HCl I add and make the vinyl chloride. That's true, but it is complicated to do that because the product is still reactive. And so you have to do this in a way that keeps things exactly at a one-to-one -one rate, and that's not easy to do because HCl is a gas. It's hard to control the amount of gas you add to something. Okay, And so... Uh, while technically, yes, you can do this for the purposes of this class, always assume if I write an alkyne and HCl that there's plenty of HCl to go on and do the second reaction. Don't assume that that's a one-to-one -one ratio, okay, unless I explicitly say one equivalent, okay?
So on my test, if I gave you a problem like this and I wrote this in HCL, you would assume that this is there in excess. If I didn't want you to assume it, I would write it like this, one equivalent or one EQ, okay? Something like that. Okay. Halogens do the, exactly the same thing. The halogen will add to give the trans dihalide, which will then add halogen again and we'll end up with a tetrahalide. Nothing new there. The mechanism is exactly the same as you learned for the addition of halogen across a carbon-carbon double bond, with the exception of the intermediate being a heck of a lot more reactive, right? Because we have this carbon-carbin double bond now in the three-membered ring, so it's really strained. And so you get this uh, chloronium ion or halonium ion. The chloride attacks, breaks. You end up with the trans dihalide. That then continues to react again, and you get the tetrahalide. So nothing new. You just need to know that you're going to do the chemistry twice. Okay? So that finishes up Chapter 8. But I want to talk to you all in the <laughs> couple of minutes that we have left about your challenging problem on the in inverted lecture. And so I told you, or I gave you this problem, to take this, right, and to convert it to that. It looks pretty simple. We're just adding a methyl group. But it's not that simple, right? We're taking one of these hydrogens and replacing it with a methyl group. You know no way to do that directly. And you know no way to do that directly because it doesn't exist. So we have to think backwards, OK? Not backwards thinking, but think backwards. We have to start with our product and work our way back to our starting material called retrosynthetic analysis. And we know from our reading that we can make cis alkenes from alkynes. So if I could get this molecule, I'd be in business. All I have to do is add hydrogen across the carbon-carbon triple bond one time using either Lindlar's catalyst or nickel P2 catalyst, which is discussed in your book. And it just adds hydrogen once, and it stops. It doesn't add hydrogen to alkenes. It only adds hydrogen to an alkyne. But is that what I have? No, but I can get that if I had a carbon-carbon triple bond with a hydrogen. If I had that, I could get that methyl group on there pretty easily. But do I have that? No. But I know I can get carbon-carbon triple bonds by double elimination of dihalides. Do I have that? No, but I can get it really quick from this, right? So I can take this, I don't know, let's just pick on bromine. I can add bromine across the carbon-carbon double bond, right? And what do I end up with? I end up with the dihalide. Br, Br, H, H, H. And I can eliminate two moles of HBr using what base? Sodium amine. I need that in excess. It will do the elimination twice. And actually, it will give me, since I have an excess of it, it will give me the acetylide. Because remember, acetylenes that have a hydrogen are acidic. So once that forms, the excess amide will react with that. What do I know about these molecules? Are they good nucleophiles or not? These are really good nucleophiles, right? So I can take that and react it with iodomethane, bromomethane, chloromethane, whatever you wanted. That's going to do what kind of chemistry? What's that? SN what? SN2. I'm going to now make the carbon-carbon bond that I need. A 
I'm right here where I need to be. Now to get to the product, I'm going to use hydrogen gas and Lindlar's catalyst. Lindlar's catalyst will add those hydrogen atoms across that carbon-carbon triple bond in a syn fashion. And I will get the product. That's what there is in that problem. Okay? Now, let's suppose we just answered that. Let's suppose I gave you this as the product where it's trans. What would where would things be different? <coughs> things would be different at the end. Everything else would have been the same, but here Lindlar's catalyst adds the hydrogens in a syn fashion because it's heterogeneous. It's like this surface of the table. If you imagine it having hydrogens on it, if the alkyne comes down, it's going to pick up the hydrogens from the same face. I need to have the hydrogens on opposite faces for that product, right? And it turns out there's another way to do that. Can anybody tell me what it is? You would use lithium metal and liquid ammonia. It's called a dissolving metal reduction. It's kind of a cool reaction because lithium and liquid ammonia is a blue solution. It's pure electrons in solution, believe it or not. Electrons are blue. Who knew? NH3? That's L for liquid? Yeah, bracket. Parenthesis. So that's dissolving metal reductions. So if you want to make a trans alkene, you use dissolving metal reduction. If you want to make a cis alkene, you use Lindlar's catalyst or nickel P2 catalyst. It's all in your book. You need to review that. Okay? Because we can add hydrogen across alkynes two different ways to get alkenes, either cis or trans. All right. On your way out, turn in your inverted lecture.